Oh, that works. <laughs> Amazingly, sometimes it works. Um, right, so thank you, Tom, for this wonderful introduction to, to Mike's work and uh, what he's done through his life. I'm going to talk more about vision, but very much in the spirit of Mike. Uh, so Mike looked at all sorts of, uh, of animals across the animal kingdom, as, as Tom has just shown us. And uh, nearly, well, actually not nearly, but in every case where he looked at a new animal in a new place, he, he tried to measure the performance of, of the eyes and the visual system to see what it would do. And um, he did that because he wondered about what, what, is the, what are these eyes used for? He, he always asked what, what, what was the purpose of the eyes? What kind of functions did they serve? And uh, in that kind of spirit, you can kind of ask in general, what are eyes actually used for? The obvious answer is seeing, yes. But you can actually divide vision into a number of different major domains. Um, and from that falls out that there is one domain that is extremely essential to us and to basically all animals that have eyes, but it's unexplored. So there is an unexplored, you all have an unexplored domain of vision in your, in your system. I'm gonna tell you about that towards the end. But first let's have a short look at the, the diversity of, of the visual systems, which Mike was one of the people who actually told us about. Uh, there are of course all sorts of, of it's eyes on the head, it's cephalic eyes that sit on the head. They are paired. There's the left eye and the right eye. Um, vertebrates have it. There are lots and lots of different animal groups that have these paired cephalic eyes. Some have eyes like us, who cannot have eyes. Others have compound eyes. Um, some have high resolution eyes. Others have low resolution eyes, like little slugs and all sorts of worms that have paired cephalic eyes. You would think that that is eyes. If you think about eyes, that's what you think of normally. But there are also other weird eyes. There are median eyes. Many animals have median eyes right in the midline of the head, often together with lateral eyes. Uh, vertebrates actually have something like that as well. Um, that is, for instance, a vertebrate, that's a lizard, which has a parietal eye. Uh, we have something similar. We've got a pineal organ. Uh, we are mammals, and mammals have lost their light sensitivity in the pineal organ, but otherwise, um, pineal organs are light sensitive, medium, little light sensitive organs. So we have it. Lots of other animals have similar things like that. And lots of animals have eyes on other parts, especially animals that have reduced or lost or never had a proper head. They've got eyes in various other parts and might work on many of them, like the scallop eyes and their eyes on all sorts of other things like again, bandworms that we may have can hear a bit more later on and uh, starfish and jellyfish they will have rather amazing eyes, um, but not on the head, because they don't really have a head. Then there are actually animals that have um, vision, but no eyes at all. They've got light sensitive cells sprinkled over their body, and they display visually guided behaviors. They can move towards particular structures that they like, but they don't have any proper eyes. So vision is more than eyes, actually. Um, from this enormous diversity, you can actually ask them, what do these things do? Is, can we actually, is there a hundred different types of, of purposes for these eyes? Well, yeah, you could say that, but many of those tasks are kind of similar. So we can start to kind of divide vision into different types of, of tasks. And one obvious thing is if, if, it is, if vision is based on discriminating objects or not, because as humans, we are extremely biased towards objects. Everything we see, we kind of, that's a human, there a human, there's a chair there, there's a computer there. It, we, we categorize things and, and, and uh, call them things. And we have different behaviors in relation to different things. We don't do the same things together with chairs as we do together with humans or computers. Same thing with animals. Animals that have object vision, they do different things. They have got different behaviors towards different types of objects. That is a really powerful thing. All animals don't do that. Many of those animals that have small, low resolution eyes, they can't do, they can't discriminate objects. Because you actually need a reasonable acuity to do that. So all the smaller animals that don't have fantastic large eyes, but they still have eyes, they still have vision, and they do non-object-based vision, which we actually do too. 
when I walk, take a walk here, now I, uh, I see that I'm moving. I'm, that has nothing to do with objects. I measure my own speed, I know how fast I'm moving, and I can see the direction I'm moving. I can see the distance to things. I don't need to see objects for that. And that is used for orientation, which is really important. That came obviously evolved much earlier than the orientation. <clears throat> you can find animals that have small eyes that give no orientation throughout the animal. It's actually only three major groups of animals. It's the vertebrates, it's the arthropods or the insects and crustaceans and spiders, and it's the cephalopods, which is the cuttlefish and, and the octopus and squid. Those are the three groups that have evolved object vision. So now we've divided visual systems into two types. Uh, non-object based, that's kind of a mouthful. So let's call non-object based vision something simpler. Let's call it ancient vision because it started with ancient vision. We still have, have ancient vision. And then object vision evolved. So there are two different types, ancient vision and object vision. We do both. All animals do that have object vision do both. So when you <coughs> object vision evolved, it didn't mean that ancient vision was discarded and superfluous, still as important ever, as it ever was. So now we've got two major domains, but you can also divide vision into action vision. That's what Mike actually studied very much with eye movements and things like that, how, how animals use, and humans as well, use vision to directly guide movement, to directly guide actions with a feedback. So as soon as something happens, in the visual world that is fed back to the brain, which corrects and, and changes the, the actions towards the goal. So this active vision is of course one thing, but there is a, you, you also have perception. You also take in what there is around you, uh, which will affect what you will do maybe in a couple of seconds or in a couple of minutes or in hours, in days, in years. So you pick up information that is not immediately guiding or correcting your movements or your actions. Um, so we can simply call this perception or assessment vision. You assess your environment. All animals with eyes have to assess their environment. If you don't assess your environment, how would you know where to go? You need to work out, you want to go in that particular direction, that is an assessment, and then you actually do it. And that is active vision. So you've got action vision and perception. So now, if we, now we've got two completely different ways of dividing visual systems or vision. We can combine them now, which of course then ends up in four quadrants. And uh, if you combine ancient vision with action vision, you get orientation. If you combine object vision with action vision, you get interaction with objects. If you combine object vision with perception or assessment, you get what, what most people would call perception. All these things are well studied for more than 100 years. Neurobiologists and psychologists, psychologists have particularly looked at that third quadrant, but no one has really looked at this fourth quadrant. When you combine ancient vision, non object based stuff with perception, you say, well, what? But animals, of course, must have done that, and we do it too. Uh, <coughs> and uh, we do that, or all animals do that, in order to work out where they are, to be able to select where to be, the kind of environment you're in. But not just that. Um, we're going to take a closer look at that fairly soon, but let's, let's just see what kind of information there is in these different quadrants. For um, orientation, you, of course, pick out the uh, borders and contrasts in the image and how they move. So it's the, what is called the optic flow. For uh, interaction with objects, you have to separate objects from the background. Often using cues from exactly the same neural circuits as you use here, you use to select objects. <laughs> then in order to interact with objects, you need to, you need attention, so you need to be able to focus on particular objects. For um, the third quadrant, it's basically the same as the, the second, it's just that you have to take in more things, so you get an assessment of the situation. You see those things are there and they're moving in those directions that tells you about the situation. The fourth quadrant is then more about reading the conditions. It takes very much the same information as from here, but actually also does something else, which is rather different. The distribute, distribution of light in the environment. So that's not concerned with single scenes. 
if you're in one place and look like that, you see all the things over there, you turn around and move a few meters, you see something completely different, but you're in the same environment. How can you assess what kind of environment you're in? Because doing that is actually important. Animals have to select their habitats. They need to know where they want to be, or they need to know if they're in the right place or if they should relocate to another place. But they also need to work out what to do because they shouldn't do the same thing all the time. Animals have a large behavioral repertoire and they have to pick the right behavior at the right time. So that depends on where they are and what the conditions are, what time of day it is, what the weather conditions are, lots of things like that will have to be taken in to determine what to do. So <clears throat> animals of course have to forage, find food and uh, escape from predators, which where that poor fish that has miserably failed on. Really. I think the, uh, the bird of prey, the eagle, had actually better vision than the fish that so outperformed the fish there. Um, animals have to interact socially. They have to engage in reproduction or take care of nests and young and things like that. It's another different types of behaviors that animals have to do. Animals also need to recover and rest and sleep. These are also behaviors. So that you can make a long list of different types of behaviors which animals constantly have to choose the right kinds of behaviors from. So that's really important. Vision has a very important role in determining where to be and what to do. If you end up in one of these two environments, you'll probably, if you had a choice, you possibly, some of you would pick that environment and, and I guess a few would pick the other environment. But wherever you end up, you would not just randomly choose activities. You would pick some, a few activities would seem natural under those conditions in there and other activities would seem natural in the other place there. But how can we assess, how can animals and, and humans assess the environment? It, because as I just said before, if you look at different scenes like that, it's kind of irrelevant if you want to assess the environment, that there is a tree over there and a tree over there. You don't really need to know anything about trees to assess that it, this environment. So if we just add many of these scenes on top of each other, if you have a really slow part of your visual system, which will accumulate over a little while, that will accumulate information about the general distribution of light and the general distribution of structure. We can quantify this, and animals can, of course, quantify it in, in a simple way. If you have um, in this diagram, everything that is straight down here in the diagram, and that is straight up, and you've got intensity in various ways on these scales here. That's how in in, a, in an environment, the intensity varies from straight down to straight up. So there is an, a vertical gradient of intensity. There is also a vertical gradient of contrast, which is a proxy of how much visual structure there is. Up in the sky, there's not much visual structure. And that depends on the environment, how these curves look. There may also be, uh, or there is a vertical gradient of spectral distribution of different colors, different wavelengths of light. And if you combine all these things and look at different environments, it turns out that you can characterize with very little data the difference between different types of environments. Um, up here, you have a forest, a <laughs> semi open environment, and that's a really open meadow. But even if you look at different types of forests, you can tell different types of forests apart and say that that is that type of forest where I want to be, that's another type of forest where I don't want to be, or even different parts of the forest, the same forest. You can Pick that out from these curves. Um, the same thing is true for, for the underwater worlds. Different underwater worlds have different vertical light gradients. The same environment under different conditions. This is exactly the same environment under different weather conditions. They, they are really reliable cues from these vertical light gradients that tells you what the conditions are. You can also tell the time of day from these vertical light gradients, and you can tell the season if you're in a place where there are seasons. So all these things you can work out, you can work out the type of environment, weather condition, time of day, season, and if you live in water, you can even work out the depth. And you can do those things independently. So you get separate information about all these things, which is incre incredibly powerful to work out where to be and what to do. So what part of the eyes does this? Well, in uh, insects, for example, you might think it's the large compound eyes, but I would actually suggest it's these median eyes that does it. At least in many insects. Some insects may actually be partly the compound eyes. Um, 
let's take a look at the vertebrate system. We've got, as we know, the eyes, and from the brain, there are light sensitive parts, the pineal organ, then some, some vertebrates actually have a parapineal as well, and some, some animals have evolved a, a parietal eye up there. Um, but these sy systems actually look very, very similar. If we look at the shortly at the neural circuitry there, it turns out because there are two different types of light sensitive cells in the animal kingdom. They're called cilia in rhabdomeric photoreceptors. In the, the eye, in our eye, in vertebrate eyes, there are our primary photoreceptors, are cilia photoreceptors, but they connect to the neurons or a subset of the neurons that feed into the brain are of the other type, which is called the rhabdomeric type. If you look at the pineal organ, it turns out that there is also a subset. They have the primary photoreceptors are ciliary, but a subset of the neurons that feed into the brain are actually rhabdomeric photoreceptors of the other type. This looks awfully similar. So there is there are extreme similarities between our medium photoreceptors, well, not ours, because we haven't got them, mammals have lost them, and the eyes. And that doesn't look like any other part of the animal kingdom. Because in general, the lateral eyes are of the rhabdomeric type. It's the median eyes that sometimes rhabdomeric, sometimes ciliary, and in some cases, even both. The sister group of, of the vertebrates, the lancelets or antioxys, they still exist today, they have no lateral eyes. They only have median eyes where they, and there are, there are rhabdomeric and ciliary photoreceptors just in the midline. Vertebrates have this combination both in the midline and as lateral eyes. So that kind of gives an indication that vertebrates early on actually lost their rhabdomeric lateral eyes. We may actually have lost our original lateral eyes and made new ones from that. How could that actually happen? <clears throat> well, if you imagine the cross section of the brain, at the roof of the brain, there are these photoreceptors, which may actually have evolved lateral cups to pick up the vertical light gradient because that gives you much better information about <clears throat> where you are so you can decide what to do. If those lateral cups then moved out and formed new lateral eyes, that would explain exactly why vertebrates, vertebrates have such odd eyes, why they don't look at all like the, the lateral eyes of other animal groups. So, um, I mean, that sounds weird, but Actually, we wouldn't then have lateral eyes, we'd just have median eyes. We're kind of median eyes. It's not completely unheard of. Mike has actually worked on many of these groups that have, have done that. Copepods, a small group of crustaceans, they've lost their lateral eyes, but some have actually re evolved or made new lateral eyes from the median eyes. Jumping spiders have done exactly the same, side, the same thing. Their ancestors, their sea scorpions, they had median eyes, which actually turned into those large lateral eyes. Spiders. So um, these glasses may not actually be as stupid as they may seem, but I'm sure that Mike Land would have had really funny jokes about this. Some would be rude. <laughs> Thank you. so much there. Oh, so how can you test that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's not actually very easy. Actually, much of the data is already there. Much of the, the evidence that this is the way it happened is already there. It's actually hard to get much more <laughs> the developmental uh, biology. Uh, the problem is that all vertebrates have this system. And then there is a huge gap between vertebrates and these uh, the lancelets, the, the antioxidants. There's nothing in between. We've got some uh, sea squirt larvae that, that are even more, more like the, the other invertebrates. And then we've got all the other invertebrates, which are not 100% consistent either. Uh, there are exceptions, whatever you look. Uh, it's, if you could time travel, you could do this. <laughs> Is there, are there any vestiges of compound eyes in arachnids at all? Can you see? Can you see, can you see evidence that there were not in arachnids? No, no, 
Well, you have it in Limulus, of course. Yeah, yeah, and medianized. Yeah. Right, so next is 